Claire, welcome to St. Faustina. Thank you for having me. You you didn't have to travel too far. Not too far at all. Yeah. Are you used, you said like you're used to having these lights on you? I am just a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because of Gabe. Yes. My boss, Gabriel. Yeah. <laughs> he has a YouTube channel and um, I'll help him set up. And we did a little podcast for a little bit too. So I've done some of that. Does he ambush you with the lights and camera and shove it in your face <laughs> and say, Claire, what are your thoughts me? on? Yeah. No, he'll ask my help for some things and stuff, but uh, yeah, he's great. So you've gotten used to it. Yes. How do you pronounce your last name? Um, Alarud. Alarud. It's Swedish. Mm -hmm. Swedish. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, I understand you're not from Houston originally. I'm not. Yeah. I'm originally from Boston, up in Massachusetts. Uh, that's where I grew up. I was raised um, totally into the nature there and the sports. I did downhill ski racing for a bit. Oh, boy. I did. Yep. I did tennis, um, soccer, ballet, and then I would finish off and go into college doing cross country and track. Now, and do, you my main do you have that Boston accent? Does I don't think out? so. You can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but like if you were to go back to Boston, would it like get really thick and then? No, my mom, people will say have an accent a little bit. Uh -huh. um, some of my friends from school, it's kind of the little pockets of uh, Massachusetts that still have that accent. Okay. But I think my generation with social media and TV and YouTube, like I think everyone just watches that and lost our accents. So it becomes gone. like this homogenous, yeah. neutral mm -hmm. American exactly. accent. Exactly, yeah. And then how old were you when you came here? Ooh, that's Houston? a great question. Um, after college, so about 23, I think. Oh, so you really were, really did grow up in uh -huh. Boston. Yes, yeah. Never, never intended to move outside of there. <laughs> so were yeah. you with the Catholic community in Boston? Um, so there's, it's, you know, hugely Right, that's a great question. Irish yeah, Catholic. so I didn't uh, grow up Catholic at all. Um, so I relate to a lot of, I'm a youth minister now, so I relate to a lot of my high school kids who come into the faith later in their life. Um yeah, so I didn't grow up at all being Catholic, and it was later um, in middle school. My parents went through a divorce, a really hard time in our life, oh. where my mom came back to the Catholic faith. And I, thanks be to God, kind of followed in her footsteps. I saw her journey. My bedtime stories kind of became God moments. Oh. Um, yeah, she would kind of share like, just exciting moments in her life, how God was moving her and um, revealing himself to her and she just loved it and I love my bedtime stories and I was like I want that relationship with God too and yeah she started going to mass again and she invited me to go and she would cry every single mass and I was like what is going on here like why is she so emotional <laughs> during mass and so I was like all right I better sit up straight pay attention hear what the priest is saying uh -huh. um, and yeah I just fell in love with the faith and we started the RCAA program um, so me and my sister got baptized together in eighth grade for me and then we did the program to get First Holy Communion. And then I joined the rest of the kids to do our confirmation uh, in high school. So your mom left the faith? Um, for, for kind of. It was um, her parents kind of stopped dragging them to mass okay. when they were in high school. You know, angsty high school kids. There yeah. was four in the family. Uh, and the parents kind of got fed up with dragging them to church. With the struggle. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> fell away kind of just, yeah. And uh, didn't really go to church or anything else like that. Uh -huh. um, she married my dad, who was Protestant. And so if we ever went to church when I was a kid, it was actually um, my dad's Protestant church, which okay. was downtown. Um, and the only time I would go to a Catholic church was with my cousins on vacation because my uncle, um, Uncle Eric, he's very devout, loved him so much growing up. Um, I could ask him any question, like hard question. He'd always wear that brown scapula around his neck. Uh -huh. Like we'd go to the beach and he'd always have this weird like faded tag around his neck. And I'm like, what is that? What are you doing? <laughs> but uh, his family would never miss mass. Um, even when we went down to um, Cape Cod or go up skiing over the winter. Uh -huh. um, like I said, my family was actually a huge skiing family um, ever since I was a baby, like born in the womb. My wow. mom was down the slopes with me in her womb. Oh, wow. So the only time we would miss a Sunday of skiing was when my uncle and his family were up. And so that would be the day we went to go skiing, which is really odd for us because we always skied. Uh -huh. And so that entire day would be dedicated to going to mass in the morning with the family. Okay. Um, I had always had no clue what was happening. Um, and then we would go to breakfast after and walk around the little downtown shops. Um, so, but over the years, I started realizing the routine of the Catholic mass. And mm -hmm. I was like, Hey, I can actually follow along a little bit, you know, even though I went once or twice a year, yeah. uh, not even on Christmas or Easter, this was just like ski season or summer season. Um, and I was like, I don't know, between my mom and dad's religion, I kind of fell closer to the Catholic faith just because it was always the same. There was consistency. And as a young kid, 
um, I liked that routine of, okay, I can kind of mouth. I, that's what I would do too. My cousins would know what's happening during mass. I didn't. Uh-huh. And I'd feel super insecure. Like, I don't know what we're doing. Uh-huh. And so I would watch the mouth of the priest very closely. And if he's like, doing this or that, I would mimic it. And my cousins, they would kind of watch me and they're like, you don't know actually what you're saying. And I'm like, I'm following. <laughs> I believe in God, the Father the Almighty. <laughs> I was like, I know what I'm saying. <laughs> so anyways, but yeah, no, it was high school. Uh, through the hardship in my life with my parents' divorce, I grew closer to our Lord, clung to him so, so closely. Uh, I fell in love with him. And yeah, actually through my cross-country sport too, which is a very um, rigorous sport, a very painful sport. Cross-country skiing. Uh, no, this running. is running. This okay. is running. Cross country running, very painful sport, I would say. If you push yourself hard uh-huh. um, through that painful sport, I kind of clung to our Lord as well in that athletics, uh, which would carry into my college years. Um, and in college, honestly, and I can go into that, is really where I fell deeper into my Catholic faith. Um, now, your yeah. sister, is she older or younger than she's you? She's younger than me. Yeah, she's two and a half years younger. Um, my best friend, people would say, was my twin growing up. Uh, we did tennis together and we would call ourselves the watermelon sisters. Uh, we would wear uh, pink and green outfits that would kind of mismatch <laughs> each other. Um, but yeah, so. No other siblings? Nope, just the two of just us. Just the two of you. Mm-hmm. So it was the, the three girls after your parents' divorce. Yes. yes. Just kind of clinging exactly. together. Yeah, my mom and my sister and I. Yeah. 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 Okay, so you said in college. Yes. Okay, so I went to college um, and actually that was another hardship for me, right? Leaving your family, um, kind of a detachment from your normal routine. And then another d- detachment was um, I didn't drink in college, which was a unique kind of thing. It was just my family growing up. Um, we had alcoholics in my grandparents' um, generation. And my grandma, I love her to death, Grammy Claire, um, she resolved not to drink. And so she raised her kids like that. She raised her family oh. like that. So my entire mom's side of the family, we don't drink alcohol. Okay. Um, so I went to college just normal, not drinking, Yeah. Uh, which isolates you, right? In college oh, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. yeah. And so because Where of that- Where did you go to for college? Uh, Merrimack College is a small Augustinian Catholic school okay. up north. Again, God moment, because I wasn't super Catholic. Like I was into my faith, right? Uh-huh. Um, I didn't really know the difference between all the different religions or anything. So I was like just Jesus-centered, I would say. And I was, yeah- um, just so happened to be a Catholic college. And I would actually give college tours to uh, recruitments, like uh-huh. recruitments of um, college students who were going to be doing cross country and track. And I would actually advertise to them, oh, if you're not Catholic, like no worries. Like you can't even notice this college is Catholic or anything. <laughs> so it wasn't very Catholic in name. Uh, but thanks be to God, we had three tabernacles on campus uh-huh. and we had um, priests on campus. So they had daily mass, they had confessions um, if you requested it. Um, And yeah, it was really a blessing. So what made me grow in the faith though, was a couple of things. One was um, being New England. A lot of people are Catholic Yes. in name for sure. And so my cross country captains, they were Catholic and they started going to a Bible study. Now this is like only the major kind of thing on campus that started going, but it was a Protestant Bible study um, for girls. Uh, and for athletes, it was called Athletes in Action. It's a okay. career organization for college students. Um, Focus, the Catholic version, is the Catholic version. Um, but our school didn't have that because we're so small. Um, so I joined this Bible study and I fell in love with it. Just opening my Bible. It was the first time I met peers my age who were excited about the faith. Um, when I was in high school, like I said, I joined my confirmation class. Mm-hmm. Um and that was startling to me to join that because I was, you know, on my own with my mom and my sister growing in my faith. Uh-huh. And I joined my confirmation program of this group of kids, maybe 60 kids who had been there since kindergarten. Oh. And they hated it. <laughs> yeah, because you and feel left out. Like yeah. you're you're the outsider. No, that's not what it was. It really? was it I no, they hated it. You know? Oh. They hated it because they were bored of the faith, right? And oh. it was boring to them. Um, which unfortunately we see throughout a lot of Catholic churches that the uh-huh. kids aren't into their faith and stuff. And so I was shocked because I thought they were all going to be excited with like me kind of in the faith. Okay. Um, Cause I was on this new revival of like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And they were yeah, kind of like- you're on fire. Yeah, yeah. And they were the cradle Catholics kind of like, yeah, it's Jesus. Okay. We've done this before. Yeah, we've, we've been here this. since kindergarten. We've like, heard these stories. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was kind of like, okay, it's not cool to be Catholic. You know, like that was kind of my oh. mindset. Um, so I went to college and I found this Protestant group of young girls excited about the faith, reading the Bible. I was like, wow, 
this is legit. Like this is a group uh-huh. of friends that I can have. Um, so yeah, I got super involved in that. Um, come my senior year, actually, I was the president of the Protestant group on campus. Oh wow! Um, so I was very into this Protestant group. Like I would run the events, I would do um, programs and stuff to bring people to the faith and love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ uh-huh. um, in the Bible. So you were going to a Catholic university, but you were the head of a Protestant yes. Bible mm-hmm. study group. Wow! Yes. Yeah, <laughs> starting it up. Yeah, so it was a. Uh, Athletes in actions for athletes and stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, anyway, so what happened though was my junior year of college, there was a boy on campus who was part of our Protestant group. Um, but mind you, everyone in this Protestant group was all Catholic. It was only the leaders who were Protestant. Okay. Uh, and they were coming to minister to us um, and spread the faith and like encourage us to grow in our faith. And as a very predominant, like you said, Irish Catholic, Italian Catholic community yes. up north, um, we're all raised, or most of us were raised Catholic. I wasn't. Um, anyways, so it was a very interesting dynamic. So one of the boys um, grew up Catholic and he went home for the winter vacation and came back converted, like more so. And when Converted... He, more, More Catholic, Catholic faith, okay. yeah. Um, and he kind of had a revival in his faith. And he came back and he started a rosary club on campus. And I had never done the rosary in my entire life before. I remember my uncle, like I said, who's super devout, uh-huh. um, kind of holding the beads or mentioning the beads. And I always kind of wanted to. I remember picking up plastic beads in high school once, but not, okay, you say some Hail Marys, but not really knowing how to do it on my own. And uh-huh. anyway, so this boy started the rosary group where I could go and hear it audibly and join in. Um, and there was only five of us, which meant I had to lead one of the decades. <laughs> so. And it's surprising that you you grew up Catholic somewhat. It's starting in high school, yeah. Yeah, somewhat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because your mom had that background. You have the yes. uncle. You're in mm-hmm. you, the New England area. Yes. And but didn't you know the rosary. Didn't know the rosary. Didn't know the rosary. Wow. Yeah. And so I didn't know the Hail Mary either. I didn't know the Our Father. I didn't know these prayers. Wow. And so it was humbling per se, like my face would turn beet red every week. Embarrassing as well. Yeah, because I didn't know how to pray it. Um, But they were very generous and they gave me a little pamphlet and I would read along. And it was hard because you're keeping track of the Hail Marys on your Uh fingers while trying to say the prayers, while trying to know when you finish your part and the rest respond. (laughs) And it was a very, it was a learning experience, but very humbling. Um, But I got super excited. I was like, okay, I'm learning something. Uh I'm learning a new way to pray. Um, and we had a very holy priest from Africa who was an Augustinian priest join us uh, for the Lenten portion of our uh, college, my junior year, right? And he encouraged us for Lent. He said, I challenge you, my college students, to pray for 30 minutes every day with our Lord. Uh-huh. And I was like, hmm, okay. Because at that point, I actually didn't pray just me and Jesus on my own. I would schedule him in. I'm a very organized person. I uh-huh. like my schedule. And so I would schedule him in. On Wednesdays, I would do the Bible study with the girls. Okay. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would do kind of like a prayer worship type of thing with mm-hmm. the Protestants. Um, on Sunday, I would go to the Catholic Mass. I never missed, thanks be to God, that was a grace. Never missed my Sunday Mass. Um, but I would also do a Protestant service on Sundays too in the oh, evening. Yeah, really? so I would always do a bunch of things. Um very interesting too. Out of all my scheduling in my entire week of all my Protestant things, Bible studies I would do, I would always remember my most boringest part, and this is so sad to say, but the most boringest part of my week was the mass. And I would think about that and I would be like, why is this so boring to me? But let's go back to the rosary and you'll see how my journey started there. And so I was praying the rosary and this priest says, I challenge you to pray 30 minutes a day. I'm like, whew. That's a long time. Yeah, it is. <laughs> How am I going to pray for 30 <laughs> minutes, just me and Jesus? Uh-huh. Um, Especially somebody who's not used to it. Yeah, I'm like, maybe I could read my Bible, but I don't know. Uh-huh. And so I was like, okay, well, I learned this rosary. Maybe I can resolve to do the rosary every day. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I- I'll-, I'll do that, right? So Lent starts. I forget my Lenten resolution. I don't even start it the first couple of days. It was like day four or something like that. And I remember it was 2016, February 16th, I believe. I finally remembered, oh shoot, it's Lent. I got to do my rosary. Uh So I go up to Merrimack College's chapel above um, our cafeteria there. And I knelt down and I still didn't know how to do the rosary on my own. And and I am a perfectionist. I want to do it perfectly. So what I did is I pulled up um, an audio recording on YouTube of the rosary so I could pray along. So that's what I did. (laughs) I knelt down. I listened to the audio recording. I prayed along. Um, I was so excited after that. I was like, oh yeah, like I did my first rosary on my own Uh with the audio recording as a help, but I did on my own. 
And I remembered Jackie Francois Angel. You know her, a Catholic speaker. Wonderful, wonderful speaker. Not familiar with her. Okay, she's awesome, uh, especially for girls, young girls. And I remember her mentioning what's called the 54-day rosary novena. Okay. Now she did this novena. That's 54 days of doing a rosary every single day for a particular intention. Um, I think that's 27 days in petition, 27 days in Thanksgiving. And in it, she found her husband. So she was praying for her husband and she found her husband. So like, wow, that's a super powerful prayer. And in the adder, in that chapel, I was like, you know what? Let me do some research and find it out. Okay. So I pull it up and as I find it, I find, you know, it's like a little prayer card about the 54 day rosary novena. I scroll down and it said the girl who started this started it on February 16th. And I was like, whoa, that's a little weird because it's February 16th. Wow. I just resolved to do my rosary. <laughs> I just resolved to do it for 40 days. Let's do it for 54. Uh-huh. And so that in those 54 days is my radical conversion, we'll say, where I started doing the rosary every day. Uh-huh. And I picked three things very You weren't looking for a husband, though. Oh, I was. <laughs> oh, <you laughs> I were. was. I was a college student. <laughs> I was. Uh, so one of my intentions was for my future husband, praying for him. Okay. Um, another one was for my dad, because I love him so much. And I wanted to share this faith with him. Mm. And I'll cry with that one because I love him so much. And the third one was just for something to do over the summer. Um, to, you know, discern what was I supposed to do that summer? Because uh-huh. was I supposed to do an internship? I was like applying for jobs, things like that. So three things close to my heart. And so you do not miss a rosary every day if you have particular intentions yes. very close to your heart. Yeah, if you, you it's if, if it's just in general, I'm going to pray Yeah, yeah, you'll kind of let it slide. And it was yeah. like, no, I am not missing. Mm-hmm. And so, like I said, I want to know why I'm doing the rosary, what the rosary is. And in the 54-day rosary novena, there is particular... Um, what are they? They're particular like um, graces you're asking for. Uh-huh. Um, I remember the first one that would kind of stuck out to me that was kind of weird was um, mortification in the sorrowful mysteries, okay. um, which is carrying the cross mortification. What is that? And I was like, I got to research that. So what I started doing is I journaled and I would record kind of and do study, which is kind of like mental prayer, right? I was studying and learning about the rosary while helping and aiding myself to meditate more on the mysteries, which is beautiful in the 54-day rosary novena because at each mystery, they have a little meditation you can read. Uh Um, And I've done so many of the 54-day rosary novenas now and Our Lady always answer your prayers. Like it is super powerful. So if you have a particular devotion, if you have someone lost in your family, pray Uh the 54-day rosary novena because it changes your life. It changes whatever intention you have because every single time our lady answers my prayers like it's super powerful um, that's awesome super powerful so you talked about your dad yes and you you were praying for him i was yes did he at, at any point say no you should you should be you know you should be protestant no, did he try to no so he wasn't like super hardcore protestant or anything else like that okay. right he believed in god um and so the only setback I had was with my Protestant group, okay? So as I'm doing this rosary every uh-huh. day, and I'm super excited about it. So of course I'm sharing it with everyone I know and love. Uh-huh. Um, my Protestant um, leaders who I would do like one-on-one discipleship, um, Focus Catholic does that as well too. Uh-huh. With the Protestants, you would do that one-on-one. It's kind of like spiritual direction, okay? Mm-hmm. And the leader I was with, she kind of challenged me one day. She didn't say, but she was like, Claire, I want to share my favorite. Bible verse with you. Uh-huh. And I was like, okay, that's a little odd. Let's see what it is. Okay. And so she opens the Bible and she opens it to the passage that says, you only go through Jesus Christ alone to the father. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh. and so she's like, okay, that's it. All right. Good. Good meeting today. I'll see you later. And she kind of ended the meeting early. Uh, she she wanted was, to plant that seed. Yeah. And yeah. it startled me. I was like, shoot, shoot. I'm going through the Virgin Mary. Uh-huh. What am I doing? I'm like doing some idolatry thing. So I texted my Catholic friends on campus and they were great. And immediately they sent me books and they sent me like articles. And so I became a bookworm. Like within that day, I finished like a book on the rosary and like why you would pray it and like Uh why the Virgin Mary is the most powerful intercessor. And I was like, oh shoot, the rosary is so powerful. And so, yeah, through that 54 days I mentioned, that Lenten period, um, I got challenged a lot by my Protestant friends, but if anything, encouraged me more to learn more about the faith. And, you know, the Catholic faith is so beautiful because it's truth. And so as you start studying, you start researching and asking hard questions, you find answers. And it strengthens your faith. It does, yeah. And so that was the gift, too, of me coming into the faith later in my life, like in eighth grade. I was very humble in knowing, like, I knew nothing. And I still know nothing. Like, I'm always asking questions. I always want to know. Yeah. You know, like, some of my friends will be like, like, they'll kind of, like, guess answers. I'm like, yeah, yeah, like, I know. I can guess that, too. But, like, 
really like, why do we believe that? Like, what is that meaning? Like, uh-huh. let's dig deeper, you know? Yes. So yeah, it's kind of a grace to come later in the faith because you you can be humble yeah, and be like, so I don't know. <laughs> some uh, cradle Catholics, they just accept it. Like, yeah. yeah. But they, you know, it, it's- Yeah, there's something for it. I don't know why, but sure, we'll just follow along like little <laughs> ducklings. It's like, yeah, we can, but why, you know? Now, during these uh, Bible studies that you had, these mm-hmm. um, Protestant oh, yeah, Bible studies- Yeah, we started studies. having some issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were you bringing your Catholic Bible or did they have a, okay. a Protestant yeah, so I, Bible? I had a Protestant Bible okay, because uh-huh. I wanted to follow along with their Bible. Uh-huh. Um, and as I'm growing in my faith with Our Lady, like literally 40 days, like all it took was this couple days, uh-huh. uh, Our Lady completely transformed me. Like, you don't understand. Like I started going to daily mass. I started going to confession more frequently because I was being challenged so much. I started researching, finding things. That's actually how I found Gabby After Hours, the YouTube channel about the rosary. Uh-huh. Like there is so many amazing, incredible God moment stories that happened within those 40 days. Um, but yeah, my Bible study started being a challenge because I started learning about mortal sin and venial sin. Uh-huh. The not all sins are the same. I started learning about the power of confession. I started learning that Jesus did not have siblings. So I would be going to Bible study And I kid you not, every single Bible study, something would happen where the leader would say something and I kind of automatically would be like, wait, no, Jesus doesn't have siblings. And I would be like, oh, shoot. And then everyone's looking at me like, shoot, do we believe Claire, who's our friend and like is growing in her faith? Or do we believe the leader who Uh is like, she was actually a Harvard graduate Uh and like very smart. And like, do we believe her or Claire? And it was like this poll of my friends kind of like, I don't know. And so it was very awkward. And I was like, oh, Uh shoot. So what I resolved, I was like, okay we have to start more Catholic events on campus. Uh (laughs) We got to start bringing the Catholic faith really to this campus. And so, yeah, me and my small little group of friends, I mentioned only five of us who were doing the rosary um, together every week. Uh Um, We became a little powerhouse for Our Lady and we started spreading devotion to her. We started um, different programs. There was, uh, I think it's called Alteration by Father Mike Schmitz with okay. Ascension Press, yes. um, amazing program. It's called Alteration and it discovers the beauty of the mass. And mm. so, like I said, what I started doing is I started falling in love with the mass, which brought me to go to daily mass and receive our Lord every day. And I would hear amazing, incredible stories of the saints who would travel hours on their hands and knees, basically to receive our Lord, saints who would die to receive just one Eucharist. And I was like, okay, I'm sleeping in on my lazy college bed, <laughs> not walking to the daily mass at noon. You and know, it's, right there, right? <laughs> it's literally right there. Like, how can I not receive our Lord every day? So I started to resolve to do that. And yeah, and it, it projected this amazing adventure of resolving to receive our Lord every day. Um, you know, I would start doing service trips where we would go to different areas where, you know, not everyone would go to mass every day. Or uh-huh. I went one summer to a Protestant camp, um, a weekend camp where, you know, they're not going to mass. So it was like, how do you get to mass? And so I had this fun adventure where I would actually run because I'm a runner. So uh-huh. I could run down to the local church to receive our Lord and then run back and join the Protestant group. So it was like this <laughs> weird, like kind of connection of like, I still have my roots in the Protestant faith, but I'm like still growing in my Catholic faith. Um, but it just skyrocketed. So and this yeah. person that, uh, you know, the Harvard graduate during the mm-hmm. Bible study, did yes. they pull you aside at some point saying, hey, you keep challenging what we're saying here. No, we're both girls, both both very polite and, Uh you know, genuine with each other. So there wasn't any like awkward. It was, again, it was just my excitement. It wasn't like me attacking her and it wasn't her attacking me. It was just like, I'm trying to share, she's trying to share. Mm, And so, and we're girls too. We're not very confrontational. (laughs) (laughs) So we didn't really do that. So she'd say something, you'd say something, she'd kind of brush it off a little bit and just say, okay, let's move on, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay. And one of them actually, so that one we never really confrontated. There was another one who was kind of more open to my Catholic faith and willing to kind of adjust things. And so what she did is she's like, she introduced Alexio Divina to Mm. us, which I didn't know what that was, but she's like, girls, I've been doing some research and there's this Catholic devotion called Alexio Divina, where Uh you read Bible scriptures over and over and you kind of meditate and see how the Lord's speaking to you. Um, So she was actually kind of genuine in bringing Catholic faith to us, which was pretty cool. Um, So I was learning a little Catholic uh, tradition through her. So um, yeah, it was pretty cool. So you go through all of this, you're you're still doing Protestant things. Yes. And you're how do you manage is there, all Yeah. That? <laughs> how do you is is there a point where you kind of faded that out? Okay, good question. Yeah. As I kept growing, I started seeing the issues with the Bible studies and I started falling in love with the mass and I started seeing that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist uh-huh. and that we can talk to him and that we can have communion with him. And I wanted that for all my brothers and sisters. And so like I said, I started growing and bringing 
Catholic events on campus. Um, one of my favorite things was on Ash Wednesday, all the, because we're a big Catholic campus in sense, but not a lot of people would go to mass. But on Ash Wednesday, everyone would show up. And so me and my little group of Catholic friends, what we did is we sent out little flyers about alteration of the mm-hmm. mass. Um, on Ash Wednesday, we went to all the Ash Wednesday services. We handed out those flyers. And so we started recruiting. We started getting people to fall in love with our Lord in a deeper way. And that's what I discovered too. Like as I prayed the rosary and it was all through the rosary. And that's what I've seen with a lot of people's conversions. It's usually through the rosary because our lady, she draws you so much deeper to our Lord than you ever could imagine. And that's what I wanted to share to my Protestant brothers and sisters, because I was really involved with the Bible. I love them so much and I love the Bible so much. And I loved our Lord so much. And I didn't think my faith could go even deeper. But once I started praying that rosary every single day, In that deep meditation with Our Lady, she took me by the hand. Like, it was, like, you can't explain it unless you've experienced it. Like, once you started praying the rosary every day and devoted your life to Our Lady, it became so deep. And it was, you couldn't go back. There was no way of going back. Like, you just, you just had to. Yeah. So So, you've got this fire in you. Yes. Okay. And you're starting all of these events. How did the, how did they react to you? Like, especially some of those cradle Catholics are like, oh, we didn't know all this stuff. Did did you get a lot of that? Yeah. There were a lot of us, um, one of them who became my roommate later, like, they were like, what? Mortal sin? Venial sin? Like, I didn't know this. They started learning about the saints. We started learning about relics. So we started doing um, carpool tours. It was so oh, fun. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So what we started to do is just we'd find these little events. So there was um, a visiting relic of St. Charbel. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. St. No. Charbel, mur- miracle worker. He's amazing. Um, he's a great saint. They buried his body, just a humble little monk out in the middle of nowhere oh, wow. in Lebanon, I think. And all of a sudden, uh, a neon green light starts emanating from the monastery and all the locals start coming and they're like, what is this? And it turns out he was, you know, incorruptible, a saint. He's oozing these oils. So wow. he's super powerful. Like if you have any particular intention, St. Charbel will pray for you. And, and that's give you story in the country. Or the uh, world. It was. It was at that point. Yeah. And so it was close by. And so we got a group of little Catholics, got in the car, traveled to go visit his relics. Um, St. Padre Pio's, I think it was her, his heart, came to Boston oh boy. and came to the cathedral. That was amazing and mind blowing. Wow. Again, like it was it was broadening my horizon of the Catholic faith, uh-huh. you know, because as a little like Catholic community on college campus, maybe in your little parish, you don't see how big the Catholic church is, Mm -hmm. like how extensive and massive it is. So going to the cathedral, being surrounded with all these devout, like holy people, like elderly ladies, you know, with their little rosaries out and little chapel veils. And it was just like amazing. So we saw um, Padre Pio's heart. We actually went to our first Latin mass, which is really wild and cool Mm. back in college. How did you react to that? Um, It was really interesting. So again, it was one of the college students, they were like, hey, you want to go to this thing called a Latin mass? And we're like, what is that? And they're like, oh, just come check it out. And we're like, okay. And we had been doing um, the first Saturday devotion for Our Lady, the Uh first Saturday devotion um, that Our Lady of Fatima requested. And we were doing that every first Saturday of the month, receiving our Lord, praying the rosary. And I believe it was the last first Saturday. We thought it would be something special just to try this Latin mass thing. Um, And we went and it was so interesting and Amazing. I my knees hurt a lot. <laughs> I remember that because <laughs> there was a lot of kneeling. Uh, and we so walked you'd in. never attended a no, Latin mass before. No, this is back in 2016, and especially up in New England, Latin mass was unheard of. Like you didn't really know what that so was. So even with your uncle. And, oh, uh, he didn't know what that was. Um, no one did. The only reason I think this boy at our college campus knew of it was because he was Eastern, right? So okay. he would go to um, the Eastern Catholic liturgy. And so he would know of these different like okay. little things. So he knew of the Latin Mass yeah. uh, a bit. <laughs> and so he brought us, uh, we didn't really know what we were doing. But yeah, it was really interesting. We went to, uh, oh, that's the first thing I remember. Oh, there's so many things. <laughs> it was on a Saturday. So it was not like a Sunday Mass, right? It was on a Saturday and it was uh-huh. packed. It was really interesting. And they were doing the rosary and it was beautiful because the woman would chant or like say one part and the men would say the other part Uh and the feminine gentle voices was was beautiful. The masculine men voices were beautiful and they were doing it as we're all in line for confession because it was like the first Saturday devotion. And I remember going to the confessional and that was interesting because the confessional was the one where it's a priest Mm -hmm. and you can go to confession on the left and on the right of him. Uh And so what happens is when you go into your section, he's actually doing confession for the person on the other side Uh and the grill is kind of closed. Yes. And so I get in there and it's pitch black. There was no light. And I get in and I'm like, bless me father for our sin. And and like, 
he's not responding. I can hear voices. He was doing confession <laughs> for the other person. And I was like, wait, what? And then I was, and then he slides it open and he's like, name of the father in, or in Latin. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, here we go. And so. It's like you were in the waiting room. It was room. really, yeah, yeah I was like, whoa. <laughs> um, but it was really cool being in that dark little room uh, doing your sense. I like that. So and you'd then, never done that before with no, the shook? And the, no, no, oh, no, no, none of that. I was at a college <laughs> campus. Like you did it sitting in a chair face to face with a priest, you know, like it was none of that. And so we started the mass. Um, But before mass, there was like a family of like 12 kids who like went in the pew in front of us, all redhead. Uh And there was no parents with them. Like they were so tiny up to like maybe a middle school student. Uh And they all genuflected, knelt down in the pew in front of us, very devout, very holy, just like very disciplined and all kneeling. Like even one little kid who couldn't even kneel on the kneeler, like he was literally standing on the pews, Uh like just like trying to be devout. And I was like, whoa. And then the mom came. And she had like a little bassinet kind of like thing with the baby. Oh, wow. And then the dad came later. Like they didn't have to discipline their kids at all. They were just like there. And then one of their sons, I think, was the altar server. And that is what got me. Like I was like crying. Like it was so beautiful and so cute. Wow. Like this tiny little puny, like maybe seven years old, maybe younger, Uh just like bowing, doing the reverent little vocals of the Uh prayers and everything. I was like, whoa, look, I want my kids to be like that. Like I want my kids to love the faith and like be devout like that. Um, and actually that day too is when I got enrolled in the Brown scapular. Um, we talked to the priest after he was awesome. Like we talked to him for like, the, I think like two hours. Um, just asking him questions. Like there's so many questions we had and we're just college students, just like really curious. And then we and you asked, wanted to absorb everything. Everything. That you could. Yeah. yeah. And he was like, have you guys heard of the Brown scapular? And we're like, Oh, I don't know. And, and then he was like, well, I can enroll you. And we're like, okay, great. And so we devoted ourselves to our lady and there we were on the fifth and final uh, first Saturday we did, uh, giving ourselves to Our Lady and being enrolled in the Brown Scapular. Um, it was awesome. And the, we all were kneeling up in this beautiful altar before the sanctuary and getting enrolled and vested. And it was just So you're on this journey with a group of friends of yours. Yes. Mm-hmm. And these, this, you know, the, that Latin mass plus this Brown Scapular, those, that was like a big turning point for you. Huh? It was some or parts, Or solidifying. Yeah. Um, it was part of the journey, part of the journey. What solidified it was the rosary during Lent. Um, that's what solidified it. Um, at that point, yeah, Latin Mass wasn't anything major. Now I love the Latin Mass a lot. Uh-huh. Um, it's actually moving to Texas um, that I grew a lot more in my love for the Latin Mass. So but, after um, graduation, is that when you came here to Texas? Um, a year after, yeah. So after college, my dad, he had done a study abroad in his college years. Um, he actually went to Switzerland. And okay. he encouraged me to also you know, take a gap year, go travel, explore, something like that. But at that point, I was so in love with our Catholic faith. I was like, I have to do something like that. You know, I kind of thought about being a focused missionary. I was looking at maybe doing grad school at Steuben- Steubenville. Um, I had a lot of different ideas. And my boyfriend at the time, he was looking around at different uh, places. And he was like, how about we go to... Um, the Madonna House, which is in Cumbermere, Ontario, Canada. It's okay. kind of like a lay apostolate where you pray and you work and um, yeah, just like a discernment place kind of. And they have different uh, programs. So we did the fall program. And so that's what I ended up doing in my kind of like gap year of exploration and uh-huh. adventure and like doing something unique and special. So that was pretty cool. And little did I know is actually kind of like religious life in some sense, you know, the Catholic version of just waking up, praying, yes. doing work, Um, and they live kind of like the life of Nazareth of complete dedication to just prayer and doing great things like St. Therese, um, little things with great love. And so that kind of helped me learn how to, you know, sweep a floor for love of Jesus Christ to wash a plate for love of Jesus Christ. Uh Like it was very transformative. So that was in my gap year. At any point, did you consider entering religious life? Yes. So during that crazy 40 days of growing a lot in my faith and praying uh-huh. the rosary, I started thinking, I was like, I really want to give my entire life to Jesus. And so that's really where I started thinking about religious life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I talked to my priest about it and he's like, well, maybe we should look at places, things like that. And then I went away for the summer. Um, I did like an internship and then I came back and I don't know, I think I was a little um, scared of doing that. You know, I didn't see any religious sisters. I didn't know anyone else like discerning that. You weren't familiar with it. Yeah. And I was like, mm. And there's a really cute boy I liked. So I was like, mm, no, we're good. And so, yeah, I didn't uh, really pursue it or anything. And I was praying. And then that's when I started dating the boy I mentioned. Um, and so, yeah, so we ended up dating for uh, three years. So during that time is when we went to the Madonna house. And then it was after that, um, I actually went back home and my priest asked me to be the youth minister. Okay. For my home parish where I got baptized, first communion, all that stuff, which I had never in a million years dreamed of doing. And I was like, hmm, working for the church. Okay. 
yeah, I can do that. What kind of job were you looking at? What, what, what did you graduate? Making a lot of money. That's what was my <laughs> goal. <laughs> when I entered college, uh, I was planning to do the trajectory of um, kind of like what my mom did or my parents, um, working in a computer company, okay. uh, being a project manager, making, you know, six figures, like doing uh-huh. all that. Uh-huh. And when I grew a lot in my faith, um, I started picking up a philosophy as a minor. And then I grew even more in my faith. And then I ended up dropping my computer science minor. Okay. To my mom's dismay. That was the first little heart attack she had. Oh. What? what are you doing? <laughs> and I called her up and I was like, yeah, I didn't ask you, but uh, I dropped my computer science minor and I'm taking up theology <laughs> as a minor. Uh, but I still did graduate my, my business management uh, major. Okay. And so then you got that offer to be- A youth minister. Yeah. Which was totally different from my trajectory. But at that point I knew I wanted to do something for the church. So it was kind of in line with that. So I did that. And at that point, the church- my home parish um, didn't really have a youth minister for a couple of years. So they, they had like CCE, you know, they had their faith formation, but mm-hmm. they didn't have any additional like youth ministry events going on. So I had to build it from the ground up. And so I would go to the chapel. I'd pray to our Lord. I was like, Lord, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And he revealed to me the program called Life Teen, um, which you guys at St. Yeah. Faustine's are very familiar with. And th- amazing that Life Teen at that point was doing, a, I don't know, a deal of some sort, right? If you applied to this, um, I don't know, program or something like that, Mm -hmm. they could give you the entire package for an entire year for free. They could fly your youth minister out to their youth minister conference in Arizona. Okay. They could give you five tickets to the next Steubenville conference for free. Like amazing program, like everything for free. And my parish, you know, they're brand new. Like, I don't know, they just didn't have that stuff. So I was like, let's apply for it. So I applied for it. And I kid you not, within like a week, they called me up and they're like, yes, you have won this package deal. We'll fly you out to Arizona. We'll give you all this. Actually, I think I had to fly myself, but they would give the hotel and conference for free. Okay. Um. And yeah, so I did that. I flew out to Arizona and now that was what connects me all to Texas because when I flew out to Arizona, I would meet, very weird how God plans all this. Uh I would meet, you know, you would sit at random tables for lunch and things like that. I would actually meet some of the youth ministers that are now youth ministers in Houston. Okay. Um, And yeah, so that was pretty interesting. And- Who who from the Houston area did you- know. You don't remember their name? I'm really bad, I forget his name. (laughs) There's a bunch of the guys, they work in the diocese. Okay. I know some of them. Curtis, maybe. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> but very interesting. When I moved down here, uh-huh. uh, my boss, Gabe, we would go to a youth minister convention type of thing. Uh-huh. And I would meet like three of them or something like in person. I'm like, like wait, oh, I, I saw you, you a few yeah. months ago. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> so how yeah. did you come here to Houston? Okay. It's connected. It's connected actually with the Madonna house. Okay. So I went to the Madonna house for that fall program. I come back in the spring months and I'm doing life teen at my local parish, everything mm-hmm. else. When I was at the Madonna house, there was a young boy named Matthew, super devout. He's from Canada, discerning the priesthood. And he would pray rosaries constantly, like four of them a day, like very devout. He loved uh-huh. Our Lady. He introduced to me the fivefold scapular, like all these interesting devotions, uh, very holy. Like he was trying to you know, be a devout priest and he was studying the Benedictine rule and he kept very silent. And he was very, he was an anomaly to me, you know, okay. he was very interesting. <laughs> I was always watching him. I'm like, what is he doing next? Like, he's very interesting. <laughs> So he told me one day, and he didn't talk a lot because he's like keeping the rule of St. Benedict to himself and everything. Okay. But one day he talked to me. He's like, Claire, have you ever heard of the Militia of the Immaculata? And I was like, hmm. I was like, I don't know. What is that? And he's like, well, it's St. Maximilian Kolbe's Militia of the Immaculata, a organization which lay people can join to be devoted to Our Lady and spread devotion to her and okay. to the Miraculous Medal and to the Rosary and all this other stuff. I was like, wow, well, that's right up my alley because I love all that stuff. Uh-huh. And I was like, okay. And he's like, on uh, December 8th, the feast day of the Immaculate Conception, um, I'm going to be doing my consecration if you also want to do it. Um, And at that point, I had kind of missed the trajectory for starting uh, the 30 days before. I had kind of missed the trajectory for 30 days before. And I had already done a Marian consecration. So he's like, you know what? You can kind of just jump in and do like a nine-day novena leading up to it. So that's what I did. And I did my consecration to the Militia of the Immaculata um, on December 8th, 2017, I think. And I was super excited. And I was like, okay, I joined St. Maximilian Colby's group. And after that December month is when I flew back to Boston and did my youth ministry. And I came across one of Gabe's videos, one of his old ones, like one of his car ones where he's in the car, like okay. just holding his phone, like doing yeah. something like that. <laughs> yes. um, and remember, like his videos really helped me in college when I was being challenged with all those Protestants okay. because I was questioning like, am I doing something wrong? Should I be more Protestant than Catholic with this rosary thing? Uh-huh. But his videos like really saved me and like helped me stay strong in my faith. And I came across one of his videos and he had mentioned the Militia of the Immaculata in it. 
And I, it triggered a memory and I was like, whoa, I remember watching this video back in college uh -huh. and I remember learning about the militia of the Immaculata. And I remember getting this huge devotion to St. Maximilian Kolbe and mm -hmm. reading a book about him and reading about the militia of the Immaculata, but being like, kind of like sad that that militia of the Immaculata didn't exist anymore. And okay. here I was watching the video already consecrated to the militia of the Immaculata. Uh -huh. And I was like, whoa, like he has been a pivotal little figure in my conversion and like growth in my faith. So I go on the YouTube channel and I write a little comment, like a little paragraph, like, hey, you completely changed my life. Like, uh -huh. thank you. Like your your videos helped me grow in my rosary faith and in Mary. And now I'm consecrated to the Militia de Macchiata. So he ended up like responding and friending me on Facebook, which you'll know he does that a lot because he likes followers <laughs> on Facebook so that people can follow his mission and his journey and uh -huh. his YouTube video. And so he friended me on Facebook. And so that was kind of it, right? In the summer months, um, he had posted because his uh, pastor at the time, Father Urell, who some of you guys know, yes. he was moving Gabe from adult ministry to high school ministry. And Gabe hadn't done high school ministry before. So he was asking on Facebook, I need help. What, what can I do? And mm -hmm. by that point, like I was already a youth minister in college. I had helped out at two different confirmation programs. I had done like all these retreats, the acts retreats, like uh -huh. all these different things. And so I was super on fire. I was like, high school, I got you. Like I'll uh -huh. help you. Yeah. So I sent like a list of programs he can do. I was like, do this, 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 this. And he kind of texted back. And I think it was a joke. He was like, ah, oh, you should just come work for me or something like that. I'm like, haha, yeah, never. Okay, bye. And so that was it. <laughs> And then like a couple of weeks went by and he was like, no, actually I need an assistant. Like I really need someone like, would oh, you wow. consider? And I was like, no, I love New England. I do skiing every winter. I uh, go hiking in the mountains. I love my family. I would never leave them. Nope, it's not too leaving. hot down there in Houston. I didn't even right? think about that. Like I didn't even think <laughs> oh, about all the problems. Like no, <laughs> or the bugs or, or yeah. ugh, lizards, everything else. Didn't even Hurricanes think of that. And all that. No, didn't even think of those things. Um, and I was like, nope, would never do that. But what, you know what I can do for you? I can help you write a job application, like resume type of thing. So uh -huh. you can help recruit because you're a YouTube person. Like you can, you can recruit whoever you want, you know, like yeah. I'll help you. So I wrote this whole thing. I sent it to him. I was like, here, here's like a job application type of thing you can send out. Another week, a week or two goes by. He's like, no, I think you're supposed to be my assistant. I'm praying, like, I want you to move down here. And I'm like, no. And he was like, <laughs> well, what will it take? I'm like, it literally has, to, and this is what I said. It will literally have to be God's will. Like that is the only reason I will move down here. There's no other way. Cause like, I don't want to like, no, nothing else. And he's like, okay. He was like, I can work with that. <laughs> he pulls out his rosary and he starts praying it. And I'm like, okay, like whatever. And so it was a busy summer. Uh, my my pastor at the time had me doing um, Catholic heart work camps. I was uh -huh. helping with a summer camp. I was doing the acts retreats. Like there was a lot that summer. So I was super busy. So all throughout that, um, different things started popping up. And he was like, I really like pray about it, you know? And mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know. And I really did not take it seriously until this one day, just casually, I brought it up at dinner with my mom. Remember my mom, like my, I love her to death. Like we uh -huh. were the two that kind of grew a lot in the Catholic faith. And I kind of brought it up to her over dinner. And I was like, mom, do you remember that YouTuber I used to watch over the summer months? Like she would listen, like, uh -huh. you know, cause he teaches like some really amazing Catholic stuff, but like, it's hilarious. And so I'd be dying yes. laughing. And just his demeanor and everything else. Like you can't help but laugh sometimes. Yeah, his personality. There's it's just something hilarious. about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a charism. And my mom was like, yeah, yeah, I remember. I was like, well, yeah, he kind of offered me a job in Texas. And she kind of looked at me. She's like, what? And I was like, yeah, like whatever. You know, and she's like, well, are you going to take this seriously? And I was like, no, like I would never. And she's like, well, let's clean up our dinner and let's go upstairs and we'll pull up the laptop and we'll watch one of his YouTube videos and let's like think about it and pray about it. I'm like, okay. And so we went upstairs and she pulled up, you know, we just clicked on the first one, um, Our Lady of Lords, which is uh -huh. one of his best videos, I think. And she clicked on it and we were watching it. And we were watching it and she turns to me with like tears in her eyes, like halfway through it. And she's like, Claire, I think you should take this seriously. And I was like, what? And you know, it's an emotional thing because it's like letting go of your daughter <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wait, really? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, like, whoa. Like I didn't even think about taking this seriously. And you know, my boyfriend at the time, he was up in Canada. And so I talked to him. I had a spiritual director and I talked to him and my spiritual, like everyone was like, go for it. Like even my dad, like he was like, go for it. And I was like, like wow. no one was stopping me. And I was like, okay, now it's only me like stopping myself. So I was like <laughs> praying and I was like, okay. And, you know, I went ahead with doing an interview and I did an interview with Father Urell on St. Clair's Feast Day in August. Uh -huh. um, so I had all these little graces, these little connections. And yeah, I accepted the job. 
And kid you not, within like two weeks, I packed one suitcase and I moved on to Texas. Wow. Yeah. And it was like one of the first times in my life where I did a huge leap of faith, just trusting in God Uh blindly, right? Like God kind of asks us to do that sometimes. Like he'll give you a little consolations, but he's like, just go for it. And I did it. And once I did it, like once I stepped foot in Texas, once that first week hit, like God poured, over poured me with consolation, all these little different signal graces, all these signs, uh-huh. like just like reminding me and reaffirming me. Yes, you made the right choice. You're supposed to be here. And I was like, whoa, like, phew. thank goodness yeah, I right. said yes. You know, and he gives us the option. God always gives us the option. Uh-huh. You can choose this path or this path. And so, I mean, this is almost year four. I, and so this is my promise I made, Gabe. I was like, I will be here for a year only. I will be here for a year. <laughs> I will help you set up the youth ministry and then I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm going back home. And so we did the first year, which was very challenging to take a program from, you know, nothing, build yes. it up and start yeah. it brand new and, you know, introduce new things and mm-hmm. try to bring the kids to a new program who have already been there and adopt their youth ministry, you know. And the parents as well. To get Everyone. Them used it's to, a whole, yeah. it's a very hard to start a new job yes. in youth ministry, particular. And um, after that hard year, um, you know, I just took it to prayer and I was like, what are you supposed to do for this next year? Because I was planning to leave. And I felt our Lord just saying stay. And I was like, okay. So I stayed. And then the second year is when COVID hit. So that COVID kind of threw me out of the things, you know, I actually flew home because, you know, COVID, we didn't know what was happening or anything. Yes. Youth ministry shut down, the churches shut down, really yes. sad, everything. And so I flew home. And then again, it was like, okay, well, I've been there two years. Do I stay? Now I'm home, uh-huh. you know? And then, uh, yeah, and you only promised a year. I only promised a year, uh-huh. and I was into the second year. And I was like, I don't know. And then Gabe texts me, he's like, Well, Texas is opening up, you, you know, like come down. And I was like, Wait, what? <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like, Well, Boston was shut down, Boston was shut down forever. And I was like, Well, I'm going where everything's open, you know, I need our Lord. And so, yeah, I flew back to Acton, Texas, and then I did the third year, and I'm so happy I did that third year because you know, after COVID and it was during COVID, you know, like it was like half of our kids were online, half of them were in person. Like, yes, I was so excited for the third year because it was going to be easy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like after you've done youth ministry for two years, like third year is like a breeze. Uh-huh. Third year was COVID year. So it was like oh, another wow. like hard year. <laughs> and it was like maybe one of the harder years. And I was like, okay, our lady, we got this, you know, it's uh-huh. our lady's program. We dedicate everything to her. Um, so anyways, yeah. So we just trudged through and here I am for the fourth year and we're going on for our fifth year as of right now. So yeah, it's been a Hopefully no more curveballs and- uh, Yeah, (laughs) yeah. No, this year was the first year after COVID where there was no things like this. Yeah. And now we're getting vocations, which is really exciting. Oh Yeah. One of our kids, he entered seminary. Please pray for him uh, this past Friday. And then I have some other boys asking me about um, the Franciscans and other religious orders and some of my girls are discerning. So it's finally we have an easy year so we can just focus and like bring them to our Lord. So it's been really exciting. So are you jinxing it? You think you're jinxing it? It's an easy year. No, no, no. no. It's with Our Lady. (laughs) Our Lady's hands are over it. She's taking care of it. And I mean, you know, Our Lady is Our Lady of Sorrows. There's always struggles throughout the year, um, no matter what, because when you're close to our Lord, you will suffer. Looking at your the past several years yes. now going through all that now that you've got a regular year coming up or at least hoping that yes. this is a regular year coming a smooth up year. yes is there any thought of you going back to boston to boston i'm sorry mom and dad no <laughs> you're good have you, have you thought good. of bringing you know encouraging some, some of your family to come down me? here oh yes i have thought of that i haven't your told sister that. Or... um so my <laughs> sister she is up in south carolina or georgia and she's up there so she is settled and she's doing very well my mom and dad because they're entering more like um retirement time okay. so i have thought about that like i wish i actually wish it just houston is beautiful with our faith uh-huh. like that's why i love it like the humidity the heat like i i would rather be in new england with the skiing and cold weather and everything uh-huh. else like that. But it's the people, it's the people that keep me there. And I wish my mom and dad could experience that too. I mean, we have good people up North as well, uh-huh. but the the Catholic community down here is just superb. Like so devout, like young adults, older, younger, young kids, like everyone, like I am always amazed. And so I went to the ordinations this past Saturday and I was thinking about it, like listening to our Cardinal, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo give his talks again, and I've been to them before, he always brings up devotion to Our Lady. Have Uh you noticed that? Yes. Like, I think he has a devotion to Our Lady. And I really think because of his love of Our Lady, that is why Houston is as strong as it is. Like, I think because he prays to her, he has a devotion to her. He's making the right decisions. He's bringing good priests in. Like, it's 
it's beautiful, you know? And so you, you can tell there's no other diocese like this that I've ever found. Um, it is a blessing to be here. And I wish everyone could come here. It's exciting how, you know, it, one of the, the archdiocese is growing mm-hmm. and then, you know, looking at the the new guys that are coming in and, and yes. uh, the priests, it's really exciting. It's beautiful. Yes. We have amazing, a lot of them are my friends now and it's really great. So yeah. tell me about your experience with, um, with Gabriel and his sure. podcast and his show and all of okay. that. Were you, were, were you pretty shy to to, I'm a very shy person. Yes. Um, if you found me in high school, um, doing like class presentations and stuff, uh-huh. I would stand up in front of the class with a very shy, timid, quiet voice, turning beet red and barely getting a few words out. Like <laughs> I have always been very shy. Um, it's only through the grace of God and Our Lady that I have found my voice. I've found more courage and strength. Um, I think, especially in my college years, like that, just that love of God, like you just want to spread it. Uh-huh. And so, especially in college, like. I would be up and down the halls, like being like, hey, come to adoration. Hey, come to, like anyone, uh-huh. anyone and everyone. Cause we're all called to love our Lord. You know what I mean? Yes. And so I would get Protestants in the adoration chapel. I would get all these different people. I'd be like, come on, come on. Like, just come. It's so exciting. It's so, so wonderful. So different from what you used to be in high school. Just that yeah, timid, quiet Exactly. Yeah. Person. So transferring that to where I am now, um, especially a youth minister in Texas. Uh-huh. Okay, back home, our youth ministry program was like 10, 20 kids. Here, I have like 200 kids. <laughs> so you have to get used to speaking in front of them. You yes. know, like it's it's so different. So Gabe um, asking me to give talks in front of those 200 kids, that's kind of where it started of me getting more comfortable. Okay. Um, it started with personal testimonies, like on retreats and stuff, which is more easy, you know, talking about yourself and like your experience because you lived it. So you can talk about yes. it. Yes. Um, which transferred into like more current years, like talking about like, the Catholic faith and about the Eucharist and Our Lady, which again are things I love and know. So it's more easy to share, but mm-hmm. you need to share it well so that you're doing it justice, you know? Yes. Um, and then with video productions and stuff, I'm just always his assistant. So whatever he needs. So especially those first two years, you need a light, you need this or that. Like I'll go around and just move things and simple uh-huh. things, you know, like he, yeah. he can be very independent. So he likes to do things on his own. So, you know, plugging something in or something is more what I would do. And then as the years have developed he, with just the need you know, people want more videos. People need more things. He Uh started trusting me more with things. And I think through prayer and through trust in Our Lady, he's like, okay, Claire needs to have some part in this. Um, And I think Our Lady prepared me for this too. Um, I always grew up very creative. I loved art class. Um, My sister will always tell you, like my sister's the one who actually went to SCAD um, in art school. Okay. And she was always like, Claire was actually more creative than me. Like she should have went to art school. So I was always inclined to that. It's actually my mom's side of the family. My grandma went to art school as well. Okay. So very creative Uh kind of side. Uh, and then I did the computer science thing. I did graphic design in high school and in college and stuff. So I've always been inclined. Like, you know, Mary prepares you. And my spiritual director will always say this. Pay attention to what God puts before you in your life, you know, because the certain skills, the certain people you meet, you're going to need them later in life. Like God is giving those tools to you to help you later in life. And so thankfully I absorbed some of those things. And so then I was able to help Gabe with certain things. And then, yeah, in more recent years, he's like, you know, Claire, like, as a man, like I have an, a certain audience, but he's like, we need more of a woman audience. Mm-hmm. And so that kind of what started uh, my YouTube channel this past summer, um, just through cha- uh, through prayer and stuff, I started what's called the Catholic Rose. Okay. Which is a play on words of my middle name, which is Rose. And then Our Lady and the Rosary, um, because yes. rosebuds have thorns, um, but they also are little like seeds of truth and hope and everything else that you get through the rosary. Um and so that kind of opened my shell a lot, actually. Starting your own YouTube channel and Gabe would let me borrow one of his cameras and he's like, all right, there you go. I'm like, oh shoot, like I got to figure out audio. <laughs> Get to work. I got to right? figure out all this other stuff. <laughs> um, so he would teach me some things, but he's more of the um, like push you along your way and like figure it out, you know, kind of uh-huh. thing, like learn quick, uh, which is good because that makes you learn a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I did. And um, it has helped me grow so much. And there was one leap of faith actually buying my first like laptop that has the capacity to edit videos Uh was last summer. It actually happened. Now this is, I think before I did my YouTube channel. Yeah. This is one of the first things, again, a leap of faith and trust in our Lord without knowing for sure. And then he gives you the graces afterwards. So I was driving back from spiritual direction with my spiritual director who lives in San Antonio, which is like a three hour drive. I'm driving back. I had all this consolation and grace saying, yes, Claire, you need to go out and buy a Mac laptop. Now, 
I do not like Mac products. <laughs> I, me and my dad, we go back and forth because my dad loves Apple. He loves the products. Uh -huh. And I'm like an individual, like in you know, all in high school, like everyone has an iPhone. It's the in thing. And uh -huh. I was more of an individual. I was like, I like my Android. I like my Google Pixel. Uh -huh. I like my, you know, PC, everything else. Um, yeah, so I started learning how to edit. And then the filming, filming's a lot harder because it's, you know, equipment and a gimbal and yes. like lighting and I'm still learning and Gabe still gets frustrated with me. I'll, I'll ruin a shot or I'll do this or that. And he's like, Claire, the white balance or Claire, like this or an autofocus. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this, <laughs> but um, it's great. And like, it's just so exciting to see like how our lady's using this program and how it's reaching more souls. Um, and I love it. Like it's the creative aspect too. Uh, it's just amazing. It's a, an incredible gift to be able to create and be creative and add, cause you know, making a video is adding the teaching moment it's yeah. adding the audio moment it's the music and the visual and i love the visual you know like if you come to my channel like you'll see i do more scenic shots like i've flown home to boston and i'll get like beautiful like wintry scenes of the lake oh, and the mountains nice. and stuff uh, yeah uh i just i love beauty and the catholic church is beauty and why can't we share it you know like let's share the beauty of our catholic faith so whether that's through beautiful scenes in the forest and the mountains and teaching god and faith in that um or in our churches and confession and the rosary and like you know beautiful shots of that like you can get beautiful shots of the virgin mary statues like there's so many beautiful things in our faith that you can share through the visual and audio and all what, that stuff. What uh, What's the YouTube channel again? It's called um, The Catholic Rose. The Catholic mm -hmm. Rose. Yes. And then, uh, and you already have videos up I there. I do. I have like maybe eight or 10 videos on there. Yeah. Okay. And I've, more to come. More to come. Yes. I took a little break during Lent so I can pray and be centered on Lent. Um, but yeah, in the future, I might. Uh, do some more and stuff. Right now I'm actually helping Gabe because we got to get his videos out. So yes. I like to help him. Yeah. With the success of everything that you've done at St. Teresa, did any of the other parishes try to pull you and say, hey, you know, yes. you, you've got that going. <laughs> uh, we need you over here. Yes. No, that happens for both me and Gabe a lot. Uh, we'll have just people or priests being like, hey, we want you. Come over here. Come over here. But like <laughs> Gabe and I are a team. I mean, like I, I we can't function... We could, but like we have over the four years, we have gone into such a groove of working together. I do the paperwork. I do more of the behind the scenes. Uh -huh. He has a charism of like talking and just doing amazing things. I don't have that, right? You know, like our high school kids, for example, like we live more in a poorer kind of area and we get more rough kids with broken families. And Gabe has a charism to, to touch them, to speak with them. You know, like uh -huh. he comes from a rougher background and he as a man can just connect with those guys. Uh -huh. um, I have just noticed that with our boys, like, okay, sure. Like, I, you know, they're used to their moms maybe nagging them, you know, like they're not, <laughs> they're not ready for another girl to run the program or to do anything else like that. You know, like you need, I think, a male figure to run programs to, you know, that's why we have for priests. That, uh, for yeah, that particular. Like, yeah. You always need a male figure to be that father figure, right? Uh -huh. And I do more of the behind the scenes, like taking care of things when kids are crying, like, you know, whatever it is, like I am taking care of the behind the scenes and I like that role, you know, and it'd be very difficult to change that for anything else, you know? So we'll see, but yeah. So if there's any but yes, other- People try to pull us around and do different things, but as of, now, as of right now, we're a package deal. So <laughs> you got to get both of us. So yeah. have, have any parish priests approached the two of you and said, okay, we want to bring the two of you together. Yes. Especially the new priests. Um <laughs> <laughs> Not the newly ordained ones this year, maybe in the future, but other ones and stuff. Uh, yeah, they've said things like that, um, but we'll see whatever our Lord wants. And you know what? I love St. Teresa's though. Like it'd be very hard. I don't think I would, honestly. Like Gabe, okay, if you want to go, maybe, but like, I don't know. It's just, we have so many good things going. Mm -hmm. We have the school there. We have amazing priests, amazing priests, Father David, Father Juan, like beautiful for our Spanish community and English community, mm -hmm. just like, so reverent, so self-sacrificing. Like they do, that's the thing. Like, I don't know if we could do our program in other places. Like it would have to, it'd be like that first year. It'd have to start from scratch and start over. Like it'd be very difficult. Our priests are so dedicated. They come hear our kids' confessions for an hour or more every Sunday. Uh, they do confessions during our CCE program, Faith Formation. Uh, they come on retreats. Father David will sit in the confessional, like your priest, Father David Michael Moses, for hours. Like yeah. he'll just sit there. 
um, that's actually how I met Father David Angelino the first time. He drove up before he was our pastor or anything uh-huh. else like that. We were looking for priests to give confession. And that was the first time we met him. And it's so appropriate because that's where we see him now all the time in the that's confessional. Awesome. Um, and actually to Father, it's his um, anniversary of his priestly ordination today, which is really cool. But anyways, um, so Father David, yes, he drove up and he gave confessions to our kids. And I would never have thought that he would be our pastor one day, but it was such a gift that he would drive up and spend hours hearing our kids' confessions. And Whatever yeah. happened to that uh, that boyfriend of yours up in- uh, That's a great question. Um, so yeah, so my third, our third year together, um, he was asking to marry me and I couldn't say yes. And I think there's a lot of parts to it. Um, you know, discernment takes a long period of time. Yes. Um, and I just, I knew in my heart, again, it was one of those things that like God was telling me, he's like, if you want, you can say yes. Like, if you want, you can take this path in life. You can do that. Uh huh. And I was like, no, Lord, like, I want to do exactly what you put me on this earth to do. I want to do exactly what you called me to do. Nothing less, nothing more, nothing less, exactly what you called me to do. What is it? What do you want? What do you want me to do? And it was like through lots of prayer, lots of sacrifice, like, and I, in the faintest little heart, I heard, you got to let him go. And I was like, okay. And so I let him go. And it was scary because I was like, does that mean I had to discern religious life? You know, all these big questions uh, or anything yes, else. Yeah. And I was like, calm down, Claire. Like you're just making one life decision after mm-hmm. the other. Um, and so that's what I did. And I was like, you know what? I know after a breakup, especially a long breakup like that, like you need time to just grow closer to our Lord again, mm-hmm. like grow deeper. And so that's what I did. I took a year to kind of do that. And then after that year, I was like, yeah, I kind of want to discern religious life. And so that kind of began the journey of visiting places, um, praying, discerning. And it's a long, and shall I say painful, a discernment always like of just like detaching, dying to yourself, uh-huh. being more resolved to do what God wants you to do uh, because we have our own loves and inclinations and you just got to stay focused and yeah, ask what does he want? What does he really Did want? Did you visit a lot of convents? I and... have visited different places, yeah. Um, early on, I visited the um, Poor Clares in Alabama. I visited the Slaves of the Immaculate Heart up in uh, Massachusetts. They uh-huh. were the first ones I visited. And uh, those were good. So Slaves of the Immaculate Heart, they're an active order. They were the first ones I visited. They do the Latin Mass and they do three rosaries a day. And a lot of their prayers were similar to the ones I did. And I just felt like it wasn't enough. I was like, I want more maybe like cloistered, like devout prayer life. Okay. So that's what um, inclined me to go visit the poor Claire's after my namesake and perpetual adoration because I love adoration. Uh-huh. And I went to go visit them and I was like desperate in adoration because they have perpetual adoration there. So many cool stories actually. So the fire alarm went off in the middle of the night and the poor nun ran out in her little like night outfit and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I was like, oh, okay, no worries. And I actually prayed that day. I was like, Lord, if you want to m- wake me up in the middle of the night to come visit you, because have you ever seen this? It's like a life-size monstrance. It's the most beautiful thing. Oh. It's like huge. Mother Angelica goes all out for our Lord and everything. Uh-huh. And there's this huge, like life-size, massive monstrance. And she, anyways, in the middle of the night, fire alarm goes off and I'm like, okay, Lord, I know you want I'm me to come visit yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I tiptoed, went to the Perpetual Adoration Chapel, uh, which is awesome. They have sisters there, you know, doing adoration. And uh, yeah, I was just desperate, just asking. I was like, Lord, what do you want? What do you want? And he was like, not here, but maybe somewhere else. And I was like, okay. And it would take another year or so. Um, Cause actually I visited those places while I was dating my boyfriend. Cause he was discerning priesthood. I was, or he was thinking about priesthood. I was thinking about religious life. And then anyways, we broke up. And so then after that year, I was like, okay, I'm ready to start discerning, thinking again. Uh-huh. And I reached out to the Norbertine sisters just because I have a friend, uh, Frater Giovanni and now Frater Dominic who were there. And they told me to think about it. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I had no inclination. There was nothing like God wasn't really asking me to go, but mm-hmm. I was like, let's try it. So I did. They never got back to me for like the longest time. And then there was one, um, our deacon, Deacon James Anderson, he works at the Passionist Retreat Center here in Houston. And his wife had given me a pamphlet about the Passionist sisters. And she said, maybe you should, you know, check these out or whatever. I was shocked when she handed me the envelope. I thought it was going to be like a donation to my high school kids or something, <laughs> but it was like a, a come and see visit retreat. I was like, whoa, I didn't know you were thinking I was thinking that. But anyways, <laughs> uh, I went and um, I was shocked. Like I really liked it. It was amazing. Uh, when you visit a cloister, they don't let you obviously go inside and stay with the sisters because uh-huh. you disrupt their prayer life, you know? Yes. Uh, they have you visit on the outside. So I visited with some other girls and it was like a five day kind of like silent retreat. Um, super powerful. And I fell in love with St. John Paul, like St. Paul of the cross and his devotion um, to our Lord. 
And see, God already worked in my heart to love Our Lady of Sorrows, and that is part of their charism. They love Our Lady of Sorrows. And so I kid you not, like when I left there, I was basically like crying in tears because I was like, I found my place. You know, like I found my charism. I found my community because St. Paul of the Cross, like he founded the order when he was 26. Uh-huh. I was 26. Um, they wear beautiful black habits like Our Lady of Sorrows. So like when you're working in the kitchen, oh, I'm jumping ahead. I got to visit inside later. But when you're working in the kitchen with these sisters who wear the black habit, like you're with Our Lady of Sorrows, you know, you're, uh-huh. like, you're cleaning the dishes and it's so easy to meditate. Like you're cleaning the dishes with Our Lady of Sorrows. Like it was like beautiful. So anyways, I left there thinking I would join. Uh, a month later, I was like, well, you know, we won't make any major decisions because I ended up doing a visit with the Norbertine sisters in okay. California. Oh, they finally got back to you? They did, yes. <laughs> and they were very relaxed. Like they picked up the phone. I finally got in contact with them and they were like, yeah, you like want to come out tomorrow? Like they were so relaxed, so chill. I was like, sure. Like most religious orders, they'll be like, come at this date and end on this date. And uh-huh. you have to do this and that. And they were just like, yeah, you can come. You can stay as long as you want. And I was like, okay. And so I booked, this was last September, I think. Um, oh, so this is fairly recent. It is, yes. So this is last September and I had to do it right before youth ministry starts up. You know what I mean? Like it gets crazy busy. Of so course. I was like, all right, we're yeah. going to go right now. And so I did it and I went and in the car ride there, the sister, I was just talking to her. I was talking about my conversion and everything else. And she was like, you know what? We usually don't do this for girls, but because on your first visit, but she's like, it seems like you've been discerning for a while. Would you want to come and visit inside? And I was like, whoa, that's pretty crazy. And I was like, sure. Okay, let's try it. And, you know, to go inside, she was like, okay, well, you have to actually wear kind of like the postulant clothing and stuff. Okay. So that you kind of blend in and you're not disrupting the other sister's prayer life. Yeah. And you don't stick like, out and okay. like a sore thumb. Yeah. So yeah. you say yes, you know, whatever. And then you go in and it's like, oh, like, you know, they like, okay, here's your changing room. Like, here's your new clothes. Like, and you're in basically for like a couple of days. And you're like, okay, like I'm dressed like a nun. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's see how this goes. Right. Um, and they had no mirrors or anything else like that. So I was like, okay. And yeah. Oh, no mirrors. Like, so you don't, you can't look at yourself. No, you don't. Okay. Like you have to have the other sisters like help you figure uh-huh. out how to put everything together. So I was there and first day was like cloud nine. Like it was the most amazing, beautiful thing ever. And that's what I say to young girls, like go visit, you know, because like, it, once you get married and you have kids, like you're never going to be able to go inside a cloister. You're never going to be able to visit and experience religious life. Uh-huh. You aren't. You, you just can't. Yeah. As a young single woman, you can go and visit all these amazing convents and religious orders. Like go have fun. Like go visit them. You know, like it's an amazing experience. So I, first day was cloud nine. Like it's literally like heaven. It is. Like you're wow. with the sisters. They do everything with love and devotion. Like I just can't, you can't experience unless you've been there and they're Uh in the mountains and they have it's like beauty of growth like they have apple trees and fruit trees and like strawberries growing and like i mean different seasons but like all these different (laughs) things and they had cows and they had sheep and they had dogs and they had cats i love cats and they had like so many beautiful things and it was just like amazing and just like very ordered very uh, i just love that like just the simpleness and you process into everything and you pray together and you have a normal prayer life. Like you have adoration, you have mass, you have prayer together. And the amazing, most beautiful thing, I remember one day, uh, the younger sisters, we all had like a little bit of free time of some uh-huh. point. And so I was like, mm, what do I do? And you, know, you ask your Lord, what do you want to do? And I was like, I'll just go to the chapel and visit him, you know? So uh-huh. I go to the chapel. Where's all the other sisters? In the chapel. Like, <laughs> you know, like in your free time, like you can go out for a walk, you can go do whatever. Yeah, yeah. They're all in the chapel, you know? So like, it was beautiful to look around and be like, these girls think like me. You know, like you found people who are similar to you. And it was so exciting. Um, but while I was there, I was, the second day was actually the feast day of Our Lady of Sorrows. And I felt a lot of sorrows with her. And it was a very hard and and it's a very painful day. Like uh, discerning a religious life is uh, very trying. It's, you know, you know, my heart goes out to anyone discerning. And like, it's a very gentle period of time. You know, like some people um, who haven't discerned religious life are more, I think, have positive about it and be like, why aren't you entering or why aren't you doing this? And like, can you really push people? And like, uh-huh. sometimes that can be helpful for people, but sometimes it can be um, hurtful or like it deters you from continuing to discern or like- Becoming too pushy. Yeah, yeah. it can like really hurt you and stuff. So um, it's, how should I say? It's just- all emotions, you know? So be very sensitive to anyone you know who's discerning religious life and know uh-huh. that they're going through a lot. <laughs> you know, like it's a very, because they're d- considering to give up everything. You know, they're considering to die to themselves and give their life away, you know? So it's a very uh, painful experience. And so that was day two. Day two was Our Lady of Sorrows Feast Day. And it was a lot of sorrows. And it was realizing like, wow, you would give up your family. You would give up 
my youth ministry would give up all my kids. It would oh, give up. Yeah. It would give up Texas. It would give up like everything. And so what that did is it made me really realize how attached I am to things. Uh-huh. Like you know, like as a Catholic, a young person, like I'm continually to trying to detach myself and you know connect yourself to heaven, connect yourself to God. But I was like, shoot, I'm still really attached to things. Yeah, you know. Um, and so realizing those things, and so those wounds kind of came up a little bit. And I realized I looked around at the girls and I was like, wow, wow. Wow, like no human in their right mind could actually do this. No one. Yeah. You literally can't. No yeah. one could actually do this. And I looked around at all the sisters and was like, they have authentic vocations. Like they're called to be here. And like you yes. know that. Because no one, no young girl in their right mind would be a cloister nun. You just wouldn't, you know? Like it's only by the grace of God. It's only by the Virgin Mary. It's only by God. And so it gave me amazing respect and grace for these women. And it realized me too, like I didn't have the graces uh-huh. to enter, you know, and like I was like, Lord, and so that's kind of been my prayer. Like, Lord, like if you really want me to do this, you have to give me the graces because uh-huh. I don't have the graces. Like, I'm not detached. I'm not, you know. And anyway, did you so, think about Gabriel? Like, oh, what's he going to do if I? Yeah, no, I did think of that. I was like, <laughs> all right, see you later. But we've talked about it. You know, like uh-huh. I have to figure out my vocation. You know, like yes. whether it's marriage or uh-huh. religious life. Like both of them would definitely be an end to youth ministry. You know, because if you're a young mom, like taking care of kids, like I thought about that. Like if I had married my boyfriend at the time, like I would have moved. I would have left. You know, uh-huh. like I wouldn't have been here. So we have definitely talked about like, yeah, uh, the end of St. Teresa's youth ministry, which is really sad, but <laughs> but I had to figure out my vacation at some point. Um, yeah, and I talked to Father David about our discerning religious life too. That was really hard and sad. Um, I mean, he's fine with it, but me in tears, I'm like, I don't have to leave. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was all last fall. So anyways, a uh, month later, um, when I left the Norbertine sisters, one of the things that kind of stood out to me was they said that at some point in your discernment, you would have to fall in love or you would have to, um, conform your life to the charism of the community you kind of joined. Uh-huh. And I was like, hmm, well, the Norbertines, theirs is like liturgy and stuff, which I love liturgy. But I was like, I love Our Lady of Sorrows. You know, I love the Passionists. Uh-huh. And so I had already set up a 10 day come and see the following month in November, I think. And so I was holding out for them. I was like, let's go. I, Norbertines was beautiful, amazing. Like, highly suggest visiting for anyone. Like, it was beautiful. Like, the holy, holy, holy people there. Uh-huh. Um, such a hard and rigorous for life, but they give you the food, they give you the nourishment, they give you the resources to survive, you know, to, to live that life. Like uh-huh. every morning you read the list of martyrology, like the martyrs. So imagine each morning waking up, like you're listening to the martyrs. You're listening to people who died for their life, for the, for the faith. Um, the mother superior was wonderful. Like she would talk to the sisters, like reminding them to love God, to deny yourself, to, you know, the first step to prayer is mortification and like a death to self and, and penance and sacrifice and I mean, that's what the cloister life is, you know? And so it was like perfect. It was like, that was giving me the the strength for each moment, for each day to get through my stay there. Cause it was a very painful stay there. How long were you there? I think five days, only okay. five days. Yeah, but it was hard <laughs> every moment, uh, but it was good. After the five days, did you have a definite answer? answer? Yes, yeah. So after the five days, I knew I wasn't called to be a Norbertine, at least at that point. Uh-huh. And I was excited to go visit the Passionists. And yes. so I was like, let's go visit them. I have this stay set up. So that's what I did the following month. Um, and I went all excited, like literally thinking like, this might be it. Cause the last time I visited, like I was on cloud nine uh-huh. and now I visited inside a cloister for the first time. That was awesome. So now this is my first time visiting inside the cloister of the Passionist. So I was super excited. Um, I went and I was like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you. Nope. I went in and I guess that's part of discernment, right? And I went in and I was like, nope. Like it was just so different. Like, and I think God planned that out perfectly because Norbertines were beautiful. They were thriving. Uh-huh. Like you could just see in their gardens and in their nature and like uh-huh. everything they had, like they, they had so many vocations that sisters had time to do like the fine arts and creating beautiful masterpieces of icons. And, you know, like they, they, it, they were growing, you know, and there was like fruit in life there and girls who thought like you. And, uh-huh. and, and there was another youth minister or used to be a youth minister girl at the Norbertines who had given up youth ministry to be there. So there's people there I can connect with. And at the Passionists, they're grow- like they're growing. They're they're on a great path. Like they're doing really good things. Like you can see how the Lord, again, every single sister of the Passionists I met had a vocation. You know what I mean? Like they were called to be there. Yes. And that was something beautiful to see is that they followed God's path and they were in the right place because each of them were paying a certain, each of them were, each of them were a special attribute to that community. And you could see that they were meant to be where they were. 
Um, one of the sisters, I think she was actually the vocation sister. She is beautiful at chant and playing the organ. And so she's been teaching the sisters how to sing beautifully. And mm -hmm. I got to join in on that. I'm not a big singer, but uh, <laughs> some of their sisters, it was like during COVID or something, they're they were visiting or doing something else like that. And so they couldn't come back, you know, cause you have to do your two week stay before coming back into the community. Okay. And anyways, so they had less sisters that week I was there. And so they needed help singing. And so I kind of jumped in and sang and chanted and it was just beautiful. Um, it was good. It was just, I had read about St. Paul of the cross. I had visited the Norbertine sisters who kind of follow the normal religious life of what religion should look like. And these sisters, it was just, it was not what St. Paul of the Cross kind of originally had. You know what I mean? Like it was missing kind of elements of that sacrifice. Shall we okay. say that? I think that's what it was. It was just casual. It was just too relaxed. You know what I mean? Like okay. if you're going to give up everything and you're going to die to yourself and give your life away, you need the martyrs, you need sacrifice, you need penance, you need the cross of our Lord. Okay. You need that strength. That's where you get your strength. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And these sisters, although they were passionists, passionists in name, like, and there's so many different passionists out there. So you're not gonna be able to look up and see which one I visited okay. but <laughs> and call them out or anything. But the ones I visited, like, for example, during mealtime, like with the Norbertines, you would listen to great saint stories and be inspired. And with these passionists, they were doing a Bible study, which is just, it was one that, you know, I've listened out in the world. It was kind of, it wasn't Father Mike Schmitz, which I love. I love Father Mike Schmitz, but it was kind of like one of those just casual uh, Bible studies that was good for anyone, but it wasn't like hard, rich, harder stuff to okay. absorb. You know what I'm saying? Like it was kind of like lukewarm, kind of like Bible study reading. And then what was happening was um, we went to the Passion section of the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And they skipped over it. Like they fast forwarded it. Oh. And I was kind of shocked by that. And I thought maybe they screwed up the tape or something. Uh -huh. And then the sisters told me after, like, it's kind of hard to listen to you like while you're eating. And I was like, what, what? Like, <laughs> <laughs> are we supposed to always have the passion of Jesus Christ always on our hearts and minds? And uh -huh. so there were just little things. I was like, I don't know, they're doing well, you know, they're growing and they're doing a lot of good things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just like the church itself, like it's growing, like the youth are bringing the faith strong and bring it back to our Lord crucified. But um, when I visited them, like they just weren't where I was supposed to be. And so I asked the Lord too, you know, like God can call you to a place to help it grow or, uh -huh. you know, it's not about what is more traditional or what's more rigorous or what's more, it's not about that. You know, it's where God is calling you, Yes, you know, cause God could have called me to that. Like you yes. could have been like, die to yourself, eat food that doesn't taste good, you know, suck it up. Like this is going to be your penance. <laughs> Go to a place, you know, that doesn't, you know, do things how you're used to things going. Um, yeah. And that's a penance in itself, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what God could have called me to. But like, I was praying and I was like, I don't think I'm called to be there. Um, so when you come out after how many days were you there? 10. 10, ten days. days. Wow. 10 long days there. Yeah. You come out, what are you thinking now? You're thinking, uh, oh, well, I guess I'm not called to any religious. No, it was um, it was hard to let go of that. I was kind of like at a loss. It was a period of like, all right. It, I was going into the period of Advent, of Christmas Advent. And so I was like, it's a very busy period for youth ministry. So I was like, let's just focus on the kids. Let's focus uh -huh. on youth ministry. Let's focus on the church, uh, get through Advent. And then afterwards we can continue discerning and seeing what God's calling me to. And not just to stress out. Uh -huh. I think that's what was happening too. Um, uh, were you pressuring yourself? Um, what had happened was that year, like last year during the COVID year, a lot of the college students were home uh -huh. um, for, you know, doing online college and everything. And so I was surrounded by a lot of young college students who were all discerning their vocation, like a mm. lot of them. And they were all wanting to do visits and giving their life away. Uh -huh. And so I was kind of over here a little bit older, you know, out of college. And I was like, I got to figure my life out. And so I, I felt that extra pressure, which, mm -hmm. you know, it can be good to, you know, you have to just figure out your vocation and ask God and be always open. Um, so I think it did add a little bit of an extra pressure. Um, I think God worked with that and like gave me a lot of good experiences because I work in youth ministry. I better know how to help kids discern. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and through all those pains and tears and me myself trying to figure out my vocation, which I'm still doing, um, it has helped me so much to help kids figure out their vocations and learn. Um, I'm still learning and growing. Like I had um, one of my, my priests that I like to talk to from back in Boston. I was talking to him and he's like, yeah, Claire, you have a lot 
a long ways to go, you know, <laughs> to figure out because he's like vocation director and everything, and he's amazing and like can really help you and pick out different things how God's calling you. So but, at this point, you're still kind of yeah. So in the spring month and into the summer month, I'm open to whatever God's calling me uh-huh. to. Um, I definitely have more of an inclination to religious life just Mm -hmm. because I want to give my whole life to God. But I mean, we're all called to do that, you know, in our own way to give your entire life to Jesus Christ. Um, And I can see that and I'm doing that in my youth ministry and in the online social media in bringing people. And I've seen a lot of fruits, like God keeps asking me to die my, you know, I think he's bringing me through all these experiences to help share that to others, you know? Um, Yeah, discernment's a hard thing, but I'm still discerning. I'm still uh-huh. trying to figure it out. And I'm just asking God because I just need a community to kind of pop up and be the one for me, you know, because uh-huh. passionists were beautiful. Norbertines were great. Um, but God is God. And I think what he's asking me to do right now, what, what we're all called to do is fall more in love with him. I think that's something what I really recognized and realized visiting with the Norbertine sisters mm-hmm. who are spouses of Christ, visiting with the passionists who are beautiful spouses of Christ. They love God a lot. And, you know, we can only love God with our own strength. Uh, we, you can only love God with God's love. You know, like you have to ask for the graces to love God. And so that's what I'm doing right now in this season of my life. Like just asking God for the grace, asking the Virgin Mary, like, and that's actually been beautiful this past week, honestly. Like every morning I ask Mary for help, but more specifically the past couple of days when I do my three Hail Marys in the morning, I've been specifically asking her, help me save souls today. Help me do your will today. Like I'm more particular. Like we have to be more intentional in our prayer Mm -hmm. and specific in what we're asking for because they will answer. Um, And I was reading something this morning um, about Our Lady and it was saying that like God purposely destined it that we, like the Virgin Mary, are partakers in salvation. You know what I mean? Like we are the mystical body of Christ. We're part of Christ's church. And so we're called to also bring souls to Christ. We're also called to do penance, to do sacrifice, to save souls. You know, we can't just sit back and just let things happen. Like you're doing this podcast, like you're doing yeah. all the other things, you know, like we're called to go out there and save souls um, and to offer up whatever sacrifices or sufferings come our way, whether, whether it's in family life or whatever's going on, that is all geared towards our salvation and other souls' salvation, but we just have to do it with the right mindset. So anyways, yeah. During, during this whole that. process, yeah. while you were doing the, did the ex-boyfriend ever pop up? You know, did he- In my thoughts and minds or him himself? Or? Him himself? There was, has there been a text or something all That's of a, a great sudden? question. Okay, so when I discern and I make decisions, I make them resolutely. You know, when I figure something out, I make it a firm decision. I'm going to do this, and okay. this is what we're doing. Um, so when I broke up with him, it was like, yes. End of story, never, period. End of story, period. Okay. Um, but, you know, and I will say it's the devil sometimes, and maybe it, it's the devil sometimes. <laughs> we'll get in your head and kind of be like, you made a mistake, or you did something wrong, or, you yeah. know, kind of will itch at you. Um, but because I was so firm and took a lot of time and discernment, mm-hmm. I can't really go back in that decision. And actually watching the ordinations this past Saturday, it kind of resoluted me. Like, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the gift to be here. Thank you for the gift to be here on this podcast. Thank you for the gift to be a youth minister. Because if I, you know, in, in God's and everything, in any decision we make, he's always there. But I really firmly asked him and I asked him to do exactly what he wants me to do with my life. And I could have been off and been a wife and done all that early and everything else, but I wouldn't be here today. You know, like I wouldn't be Mm -hmm. doing the work I'm doing. I wouldn't be able to create the beautiful videos that Gabe and I get to make. I wouldn't be able to help the souls and the kids, like seeing Andres enter the seminary, like I wouldn't be with him. Like, you know, I wouldn't be where I am. So like, I'm really grateful for where God has placed me. um, And I have trust and faith that I'm where I'm supposed to be. Uh You know, every day we have to ask God, like, where do you want me today? How, who can I help today? That's my mom. She always told me waking up each morning. She's always like, Claire, always ask who can I help today? Because God will put someone in your life. Um, whether it's praying for that person or texting that person saying you love them. Um, there's always someone you can help. So that's what I do. I follow my mom's advice and I'm here today for that. And yeah. So has he popped up, um, on occasion? Um, but I think God is so good and merciful that recently, a month or two months ago or something, I saw that he has a new girlfriend. So we don't have to worry anymore. So that door is firmly closed and shut. So thank yeah. you so much for yes. coming here today and sharing you your story. Me. And you know, we look forward to seeing all the great things yes. that that you, you're and pray gonna, for us. Please pray for oh, us. Oh, definitely, yes. definitely. Thank you, you, you and Gabe, and the mm-hmm. and y- y'all's ministry there. Thank and you. We thank you so much. And awesome. Yeah, we. God bless you. Thank you very much. God bless you too.